Welcome to our next video on continuous random variables and their probability distributions. So within this section in the book we're going to be talking about the normal distribution. The normal distribution realistically is going to be the biggest thing you get out of statistics. It's going to be the thing you use the most in research or in most other aspects of statistics. So this is a good one to pay attention to. So within discrete random variables, we had different distribution functions. We had the binomial distribution. We also had one called Poisson, which we didn't get to. But we went over the binomial distribution, and you can read more about Poisson if you want to in your book later. Now, for continuous random variables, there are many, many more types of distribution functions. And in this class, we're going to cover two of them, but the rest are listed in your book, and you are free to read through them if you want to. But the first one we're going to talk about is the normal distribution, which can also be called the Gaussian distribution, or just we call it commonly the bell curve. And then secondly, we're going to talk about the log normal distribution. So these are going to be the ones that we'll cover or stress in the next few videos. But others include the gamma distribution, the Weeble distribution, the exponential distribution, the chi-squared distribution, and the beta distribution. So like I said, there's many different types of distributions. Not all of these ones down here are extremely common. That's why we don't cover it as engineers. But we will cover these two. So let's move forward with our normal distribution. The normal distribution is an approximate representation of the typical behavior that is often observed under randomized conditions, and it's also one of the most important distributions for several reasons in probability. The shape of the normal distribution is symmetric about the mean value. In other words, the mean and the median have the same value, and the width of the distribution is controlled by the variance. The inflection point of the curve or where it changes from concave to convex, occurs at the standard deviation. This is an example of a normal distribution. As you can see what we are talking about, this is the mean of the distribution. This curve is symmetric about the mean, and this inflection point, or where it changes from concave to convex, is the standard deviation. So why do we care so much about the normal distribution? It's often observed in measurements of many natural phenomena. It can often provide a good approximation for even discrete valued variables. If you notice, this is a similar looking distribution to that one we created earlier with just flipping a coin three times. And in some cases, when individual variables that don't have a normal distribution are weighted and averaged, the result can be approximated by a normal distribution. So what does it all mean? The normal distribution is so great because it provides us with a lot of information. We know that our mean equals our median with this distribution. So here at mu, that's where my mean and my median exist. And that 68% of the data values are within one standard deviation of the mean. So if you notice, here I have mu minus sigma, which is my standard deviation. And over here I have mu plus sigma, which is the standard deviation on this side. So this is one standard deviation to the right, and this is a standard deviation to the left. So within one standard deviation right here on each side, we have 68% of my data values. Or 68% of the data values exist within that one standard deviation. About 95% of the data values, you can see here, exist within my second standard deviation. And about 99.7% of my data values exist within my third standard deviation. I can remember a few years ago, I had a child that went in for some testing at his school. And the specialist came back to me informing me that my son was outside the third standard deviation for children his age. So thankfully, I knew what that meant but that meant that my son was out here in the outer edges for his testing. Thankfully it was a good thing, not a bad thing, but that meant that my son was in like the top 0.3% of people for his age. So it's nice to understand what these different standard deviations mean. Like we said before, the inflection point of the curve occurs at the standard deviation. So this is a graph showing how the standard deviation, or sigma, 
affects the height or amplitude of my graph. So if you notice, our normal standard deviation or a sigma equal to one, so here that's my standard deviation equal to one is this blue line right here. So if I change that blue line, if I lower it to 0.5, Basically, I am making my standard deviation, if you can picture those standard deviation values down here, I am decreasing that, so I'm kind of squishing my graph inward, which is going to shoot this height upward. Same goes for if I increase the value of sigma, I am widening the graph, or I'm widening where those standard deviations go. The normal distribution is a function of the expected value, or the mean, which is mu, and the variance sigma squared. So then we have the formal definition of the normal distribution, which is a function f of x, which is defined as follows. So we have this big equation, f of x equals one over the square root of two pi times sigma, all times e to the negative x minus mu quantity squared divided by two sigma squared. So this is on the range from negative infinity to infinity, and where mu is also evaluated from negative infinity to infinity. Also we have the notation for my random variables, so we say e of x, my random variable equals mu, so that's my expected value equals mu, and my variance v of x equals sigma squared. So I don't know about you guys, but when I look at this and think about calculating the probability, I don't know if I really want to integrate this formula right here. I'll actually give you a hint that unless you pull some pretty fancy calculus, that antiderivative does not exist. So with that in mind, how can we calculate the probabilities? So in order to calculate the probability, we have to convert our normal distribution to a standard normal distribution. And we can do that by converting it to a standard normal random variable, z, with a simple transformation or conversion. This formula is z equals my random variable minus mu all over sigma. So why do we care to do this? The reason we care to do this is that numeric approximations have been tabulated for standard normal distributions and are in the back of our book. So first we have to take our normal distribution, convert it to the z value which we call a z-score, and we can then turn to these tables in the back of the book to find our given probability. So this process of converting a normal distribution to a standard normal distribution is called standardizing or normalizing a value. So we have to always do this step before we can turn to our tables in the back of the book. These tables are in Appendix A in the back of your book. We will go through an example with these in just a second. So what does it mean to standardize a distribution? Basically, we're taking our normal distribution, no matter the mean and the standard deviation, and we're transforming it, or we're converting it, to a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Our new standardized random variable, or z-score, can be denoted with the following formula. f of z equals one over the square root of two pi times e raised to the negative z squared over two. Don't worry, we won't have to use this formula much either. The tables kind of omit the need for formulas. The notation then for the cumulative distribution function of z is phi of z. This is the Greek letter phi right here. It's also in the back of your book. All it means is the probability of z. So this is the probability of z equals the probability of z being less than or equal to z all times this formula. So someone has gone through and taken this formula and evaluated it at many different points and tabulated those points for us in a table in the back of our book. So here's what the tables look like. You can see on my negative z values, so see these values down here are negative values, and over here on the right they are positive values. So each row of the z-score table shows the z-scores up to the tenths digit. So here I have up to the tenths in this column. Each column then further refines the z-score to the hundredths digit. So 0, 0 0.01, 0 0.02, and so on. To find the phi of z value, so the probability of z, for z equaling 0 0.46, 
we would first locate the column of 0.4, so right there. Then we would locate the 0.06 column to further refine it. So where those two intersect would be my probability, so right there. So the way we would say this is the probability of z being less than or equal to 0.46 is 0 0.6772. So you need to be careful when reading your z-score tables. If you notice the little picture at the top of your page, it basically says this right here. V of z equals your shaded area, so the area in green is what phi of z or your probability represents. So phi of z equals the probability that capital Z, which is your random variable, is less than or equal to z. The probability that z is less than or equal to z. So we are finding the probability of a value being less than this right here. How would we find a greater than value? So the probability of z happening when your variable is less than your z-score is in the shaded region. This is what the z-table tells you. If you're looking for when a number is greater than z, you have to take 1 minus your probability. So like this says over here, if you're looking for a value greater than z, then you need to say 1 minus your probability. We'll do some examples in a minute to clarify. The edges of this graph, so over here and over here, are called sides or tails. If we're just looking for a value on one side of them, then we call it a one-tailed or a one-sided test. If we're looking for both, we call it a two-sided test or a two-sided probability or a two-tailed test or probability. We will also explain this more as we go on.